start the lecture. This is a unimodal representation lecture. We're focusing on language this time. Um, I will. Uh, I really appreciate the questions, and 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 and, and I think I spent another two hours, two plus hours answering them. And I'm going to give a little bit more clarification on CNN just from the last lecture. Try to adapt as what was uh, maybe was uh, uh, explained either. Uh, uh, could have been improved. So, and then we'll talk about language. Um, but yeah, the, the 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 big question was like translation and variance, and uh, and and uh, I think um, both in the literature and probably in my lecture on Thursday, I maybe have even overemphasized uh, translation and variance. And and for good reason, people were like, "Oh, but where is the translation and variance really happening?" I'm like. I run the convolution, and if I run, if I have an image, and I and I really run a convolution kernel, like like, and I, as you remember, convolutional kernel, what it means is, is just a template. It's a, a sliding window template, and I run it all this. This feature map, this feature map that I get, still has all the spatial information on it. It's not like suddenly that feature map, like that, that response to that uh, multiplication, suddenly lost all the translation invariance. Like that, that it, it's suddenly all the spatial information. If I run the, the convolution here, when I the response I get, and here I have multiple because I have multiple convolution kernel that I'm learning. Okay, so a little patch. So the real, um, the real translation and variance is a mix of doing this convolution and the pooling. And I don't think I was emphasizing it uh, strong enough. You need both. Just doing the convolution, yes, in a sense, if, if, if I was looking for a horizontal edge or vertical edge, it will pick up all the horizontal edge or the vertical edges here. And if the image or the object was slightly moved, then these edges will simply move on the response map. But if the pooling was a very strong pooling, that was just a, an, a, a bag of like a pooling over, like averaging the whole content of the image. Like if I, if I went from doing a convolution to just uh, like, what is the average over this whole response? Like instead of doing just a local pooling, I was doing the pooling of the, the whole image, then I would get full translation invariance. Like I will take, I, I run it, I get my response, and then I just do an average computation over the response map, over the whole response map. That pooling is just a fancy word for averaging. So I take this responses of how this, and I just do an average or a max. Max is uh, usually what we do. So what does it mean? If I do a max pooling over the whole image, if my uh, convolution uh, kernel really hit really well in that place, it got really high here, and I do a max pooling over this whole thing, then the output is going to be very high. If the object was not this object, but a, a face of LP, which doesn't trigger that convolution, then there will no, not be any high. And if I do a max over the whole thing, then there will be a zero, like there will be no trigger. Now, if I get that image shifted a little bit lower, I get that image shifted a little bit lower, and I run it, then I get the peak here, and I do a max pooling over this whole thing, I still get a very high value. So the shift of the object will still work. So the translation invariance, if it was convolution and pulling over the whole image, will be completely translation invariance. But uh, here we're doing kind of a gradual translation invariance, where instead of doing pulling and pulling the whole image, the max over the whole image, we're like, hey, let me do just a local pooling. But because the reason is I want to keep spatial information because I want to look for small parts, but I want, I want to learn a hierarchy of the small parts. I want to recognize, hey, the eyes, in fact, two eyes. If I see two eyes, I probably have a face. 
So I want to have a convolution over these uh, intermediate response. And then eventually I'm keep pulling and pulling. Eventually I'm getting more and more translation invariance. So the answer is translation invariance in the CNN is very gradual. And up to here, up to that fully connected, I still have spatial information because if the image was like 64 by 64, I go 32 by 32, 16 by 16, I still have information like this a response here has, I know it is related to those pixels. Now, where exactly? There are some translation invariants. There's some local translation invariants, but there's still some spatial information. Now, if I go to the next step of fully connected, there I lose a lot of spatial information. It gets really hard at that point to really find a one-to-one -one mapping between like this pixel and any of these exact location. At that point, when I do the full connected, it is, uh, you lose the information. So I want to clarify this uh, about uh, uh, translation invariance um, and the pooling is really there. Um, there was also a question of like, but does it really handle me moving like the object moving? And especially, how do I handle like a, a, a person, a body that's like this and a face or an object? Like every object is a slightly different bounding box and, and, and doesn't always fit this beautiful 64 by 64. Um, so what was accepted by the community, and that's just a choice, a design choice, is take any object you're interested in and center it in the image. So do your best to center it in the image. So most of the object recognition database, that's what they will do is they will take uh, 64 by 64 or like a square and try to do their best to center the object of interest inside it. So for training purpose, all my data is centered. All my data for training is centered, but then you're gonna be at test time, there's gonna be an issue. But for training, it's easy because all the data, so all the dogs are always kind of centered. Uh, all the car is always kind of centered. There is variation a little bit, but still they are centered. Um, I said frame net, I meant word net. This part is not as important for, but one thing of why is it called image net? I don't know. Uh, I, I gave the answer. So, so there was a word net originally. Um, and frame net, uh, I, it was kind of a type. There's a frame net, but it's a little bit more for dialogue and other things. Uh, but um, word net was just a hierarchy of, of concepts. So if you have a husky, which is a very specific type of dog, it's a working dog, it's a dog, it's a canine, a carnivore, a placental, a mammal. So this is a nice tree structure. And so they use that word structure already existing in WordNet and enhance it with images. And now these days, we often just use the labels of the objects themselves, less of the hierarchy. Um, so these days, we usually a lot use the leaves of that tree uh, one. But so the objects are centered during training, but at test time, the object are all over. So how do I detect object? And that's the part I, we didn't have time to talk about. And that brought also questions. It's like, okay, uh, I have an object. How do I know uh, what is the bounding box for this? And so one way is to try all possible uh, size and all possible uh, ratio of object. Uh, you could do that. Um, a, a better way is to try to learn region proposals. And, and there, what this is and what, how to do it efficiently is, um, and for the people who did computer vision, there is a concept of image segmentation. So I given an image and I segment locally similar colors or similar patterns. 
And, and there's different approaches for image uh, segmentation, but one of them is super pixel version. What it is, is as originally you, you, you get very, very narrow, like you're very picky, like you will say any kind of change of color, I will make it of a local region. And I slowly grow these region. I slowly enhance them. I say, okay, these two colors are kind of similar. Let me bring them in one group. And when you do that, then you get associated with each of those regions, a nice bounding box around it. And that's where you're gonna get your proposal. And then one thing you do is once you get all those proposals, I'm just showing them here, all those proposals, then for each of them, you can reward them to 64 by 64 and run my CNN on them. Um, uh, but now it's not really efficient to do it running on the CNN on all those regions. So there was a really nice cool thing where the training and the testing is you run the CNN only once through the whole image. And, and once you do that, you run the CNN through the whole image. There is a way after that to find the convolution uh, kernel output and use that uh, just for that region. So as you, as you get the respond map for the whole image, if I tell you I'm just interested with that, okay, process the whole image, run the CNN on the whole image with all the kernels that you're interested in, and then take only the one that you really, for that object you want to keep. It's a, just a, a way to make it faster. So this is um, for the visual representation. So translation invariance because of the pooling primarily. And uh, how do you handle all these different objects at test time is usually through some kind of object detection, as I mentioned. Okay, now words, words are important. Um, and we talk about the simplest possible representation for word, which was one hot encoding which is uh, up to a certain point still used as an input for all of the BERT and word to vec and uh, all of these, uh, where you have a very long dictionary, usually maybe 300,000 words in the English dictionary. And, and then for each of these uh, 300,000 rows, you represent one word. And so if a word is, you can represent it really nicely to one and the rest is zero. Now, as you see, it's not really efficient. Uh, it doesn't take advantage of synonyms, uh, words also in, uh, that represent similar uh, activities. So, um, so um, well, I really like this example. Um, I don't know who, uh, how many people knows what a bargiwak is? No? Okay. Nobody knows that language? Okay. Um, so, okay, let, 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 let's try to see how people use it in language. Uh, and that may give us an example. Uh, he handed her a glass of Bardwak. Do you have a general and like, better idea of what it could be at least? Okay, let's go. Uh, beef dishes are made to complement the Bardwaks. Really good. Uh, Nigel staggered to his feet, face flush from too much Bardwak. Oh, okay. Yes, I get uh, uh, Malbec, one of the lesser known Bardewak greats, uh, respond well to Australian sunshine. Okay, uh, I dine off bread and cheese in this excellent Bardewak. The drinks were delicious, blood red Bardewak as well as like, okay. So Bardewak, what does, if you had to use the English language, what would be a word that will be similar? Wine. Wine. Okay, great. But you, how did you get it? You got it from the context where the word is used, not from the word itself. And that is one of the biggest, most important things. Like when you talk about GPT-3, Bert, Roberta, at the end of the day, their main, main idea behind this is that concept. And that's a concept that exists for 20 plus years. It's called distributional hypothesis. Uh, and so here in this case, uh, I'm about to talk about distributional hypothesis in the last sentence. But by the way, just from this, you probably got that it's a heavy red alcoholic beverage made from grapes. Just you got that from the context. So the distributional hypothesis, what it says 
is the approximate the meaning of a word by its surrounding words. That is a fundamental concept that really um, every like masking strategy and all this, they all come from that exact one. So words used with a similar context will lie close together. Their meaning, it, it's an approximation of the meaning. And, and, and we'll see that later, for example, cold and hot may be used in very similar uh, um, words, but, but will in fact are almost like a positive to each other. So, so it's not a completely perfect, but it's a really good approximation starting point. So he was mm, away because like, so in the same, the idea is that if, if the words is used in similar context, uh, then they probably mean the same thing. So I'm going to quantify the way to quantify to find that vector that represent a word meaning the meaning of word. I will not really base on the word itself. In fact, I'm going to blank it. I'm going to hide it. I'm going to. The only thing I'm going to try to do is predict its neighbors, its its context, its words around it. So in. Instead, what we'll do is capturing the core occurrence, the counts, in fact, like the, the simplest, that's why I say that it's, it's 20 years old distributional hypothesis, because before neural networks, they were embedding, oh yeah, uh, 1040. There were uh, deep embeddings, dense embedding. They, that, that concept existed before, dense embedding. And these were computed by looking at core occurrence counts directly. What are how often other words occur? So, if I wanted to uh, know the meaning of a word, the extreme version is to go and look at the 299,999 other words, count how often they appear. Uh, and that will give me an app, like how often this word co occur with all 299,000 other words. Now, as you can imagine, this is not really uh, the most efficient. So instead of seeing how all it co occur with the other, then you may be looking at a subset of those 299,000. So let me show an example for this just to help with that. So let's say I'm uh, trying to understand the meaning of the word dog. And, and, and for now, let's, let's be uh, a little bit more targeted and see what verb in for all the sentences where that word appear, what was the main verb associated with that sentence? Like, like what were the main word verb associated? Um, and let me just count it. So I have a corpus, maybe of a New York Times articles or something like this. And I just count for every time I see a sentence with dog, I'm gonna count how often the word get, uh, see, use, hear, eat, um, uh, and kill. Um, so look at each of them, how often they co-occur. And then just write this and I do it for every word. Like in this case, I will use nouns. Uh, just just to uh, make it easier. So for every noun, I'm trying to understand what is this noun represent. And to do that, I'm going to look at what is the core occurrence with the matrix. So now I have a representation. And what I can do is I can take two of them, get and see. Okay, you could do a PCA on it. So you could take all of the word verb and do a PCA and find the two uh, most with the most variant two axes, but just to simplify, let's just pick two of them like get and see and put them as my two axes get and see. Okay, and I'm going to plot all my words in that axis. Okay, so now I have a similarity matrix of how close uh, each word is in that space. 
Again, it's an approximation. I only use two verbs. As I mentioned, it could be much larger. Uh, but for now, I, I want to look at similarity. And here's a, uh, an important concept. It's maybe tempting to do Euclidean distance. Euclidean distance. But if I do Euclidean distance, then dog and boat are very close to each other. Now, what will be and why do when we look at those embeddings, we use cosine similarity often. The reason is the Euclidean distance, what does it dictate? Like, why is dog here and, and, and not like here? Or like, like, why is it here and not here? It's just the number of sentences where the dog, the word dog appeared is a, a confounding variable here. Like it's like, it's like you, it, so you want to normalize in a sense to the number of time the word really appeared. And so one way will be to take those value and normalize it. Another way is to just do uh, the cos instead of the Euclidean distance to do the cosine, the, the angle. The angle will be, in a sense, just normalizing, looking at the distance. So instead of looking at the Euclidean distance, you really, you, you're normalizing the length of the vector because the fact that there is many sentences with the word dog doesn't change its meaning, or at least should not change a lot its meaning. Really what it changes is the ratio of how often get and use are happening. The ratio is the important one. So to get the ratio, you normalize, or um, you look at the angle between the vectors. So you do use the non-normalized version and look at the angle. So that's why a lot of time when we have an embedding, a bird embedding and all this, we will use the angle because the fact that a, a certain words were happier more often should not change. Really what it is, is the ratio. So, when you think of an embedding, uh, of a BERT embedding, and you're like, I don't know how to, um, how to interpret the dimension of it. At least the BERT embedding, let's say, but the, there's a version before that, which is word to vec, like an embedding of a word. You could imagine every vector being a verb. Uh, or in reality, it's probably like a group of verbs that the algorithm found to be discriminative to, uh, between the different uh, word representation. So uh, the extreme version would be uh, the word to make representation instead of B, usually it's 300, the, the, the dimension, uh, but if, instead of 300,000, it says, hey, let me find the grouping. So instead of um, instead of using all possible other words, um, really what you will do in the representation is going to try to use a subset of that. And the classic, although it doesn't say explicitly that WordVec does a PCA, but that's kind of what it's probably doing. Is it's looking at all these verbs and see what are where is the most variance of it and use them as anchor. But uh, the core uh, is, is that these uh, get and use or any kind of uh, a dimension are really telling you how often it's this word used with other words. That's the key aspect. So if I want to learn uh, this with a neural network, any question on the direct uh, distributional hypothesis. So distributional hypothesis is the idea that the words around it is a good approximator of the meaning. And one way to do it is to count the words, but another way is to use a neural network to do that. And that's what we're, I'm gonna about to show is to how do you do it with a neural network. And, and when I told you that language and vision, the research in 2014, like really what, what, what was like, aha moment is that a year or two before there was this word to vec that came out and really changed the representation of language for a while. It took an idea that existed, but just made a nice neural network. And, and it's called deep learning. 
but the word to vec is a one layer neural network. So it's a very simple uh, neural network. So the idea is I, I, I have a word, my, let's say I have uh, in the English dictionary 100,000 words for now. So any word in it, and, and I want for one specific word of one sentence, I will uh, do, learn a, uh, a neural network that will predict its context. That's the key idea. So I will create a network that give me an input. I will predict what is its words around it, what is surrounding words. So instead of counting, instead of counting, I'm going to make it a prediction task. And that was the beauty of word to vec is taking this idea of counting words, which is kind of approximating the probability of it, distribution. Um, uh, here, you will do it as a prediction task. Give me any word. I'm going to run it through a neural network that will predict its neighbors. And if I'm successful at predicting your neighbors, in theory, I'm successful at predicting because of distribution of hypothesis, I'm, I'm good at predicting the meaning of that word. And so the neural network will be, in fact, uh, a very simple, um, uh, and I think there was uh, in the implementation, not even a nonlinear uh, activation function. It was like two weight, two linear uh, with this uh, intermediate representation, if I remember correctly. So I, I encode it into that 300 dimension. So 100,000 by 300 in such a way that I can still re-predict the context of it. And then what I will do at test time is I remove this completely and only keep this, only keep this. So word to vec is just a huge matrix of 100,000 by 300. That's what word to vec is. Um, so uh, so the, the W2 is interesting and uh, it, some people played with it uh, also uh, eventually, but it, 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 it goes from an embedding uh, Z uh, to its context. So um, the so if your goal is to encode a word, this matrix is the one you want because this one takes an input a zero and just the one word that you're interested in encodes it into this embedding. But this matrix here is is there during training, but it's. Its purpose is to take the embedding that that like uh, Howard glass. It's kind of a Howard glass that that's really low dimensional embedding and recreate its context. Some people tried to use that before Bert and Elmo and all this tried to use it to kind of differentiate different kind of meanings of words, but that didn't pan out really well. So most people use that one um, because you're. If you use this matrix, but they are related. Um, I, I think uh, um, some people also studied how W2 relates to W1, but yeah. Um, your goal, I don't know if it is non-layer, I almost see it as a clustering approach. This is really, from my perspective, more of a clustering work. Like it's, it's really about bringing things closer to together, words that are close to each other in meaning to bring them close to each other. Um, and, and there have been many different implementations, love and others, so, uh, with slightly different activation function. And like, but, uh, but the general idea, I, I, I personally see it almost as, as, as clustering. You're taking a space, bringing it to another space where elements are close to each other. This is a distance function. Like you want, you want words that have like same embedding here that they're close to each other. So it's, it's, it's really more of a learning a, a subspace where your uh, clustering is, will be more sufficient. Yeah. I, I, they, they have different roles. I mean, the, this one is really a, a low subspace learning the subspace. And this one is ensuring the structure of the soft space is the right one. So they, but they, they're both, they're both as important. Um, I'm sure there's been studied on how the gradient flows through it and they evolve over time. Um, 
I, I don't have a specific paper in mind uh, on this, but that would be really interesting to 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 look at. Um, happy to even double check on that, but uh, but in general, they, they both. Although yes, the, the your loss is here. Um, the the loss is definitely going to be propagated on both. And, and they definitely have both really important roles. Um, this, this is a very hard one, like really bringing the space. So, um, um, but it, I, I understand your question, but I think the, at the end of the day, the loss definitely will have an impact on both uh, as well. So, but yeah, happy to discuss more and let me see if I can find some uh, pointers for you guys. Um, I, I think my, um, my interpretation was um, um, at some point, the early stages of the uh, counting were, um, um, I, I have to look at the literature again. Um, the, the, the scale of the data was one of the things that was, uh, like word to vec was applied to a much, much larger, I, I don't I don't remember a paper showing the counting version on the same large data set uh, than uh, uh, on on the word to back. I, I I I'm guessing the performance of the counting will not be that bad because the huge amount of data that was there uh, definitely at the end of the day will will go. But it, it um, the the counting is only one part of it. The, the second part of it is that you need to learn um, um, a low dimension of the of the space and 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 this is is I mean it's there's been shown that you can uh, use a neural network architecture to 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 learn PCA. In fact, there's been work that if for certain network represent uh, architecture, it is equivalent to uh, running a PCA. So I will not be to surprise that really at the end of the day, this is it's not exactly because I, I, I know for sure that there's um, some constraint you would need to put on your learning um, to be sure that it stays positive and that like eigenvectors and all this. So, so it, 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 will, it will not be exactly the, the PCA, but it, it, it is similar in nature to doing the counting and doing a PCA together. So it's, I will not be surprised it is close to it, um, later on, um, there was some small extension. Blob does a, a different approach to it. Um, but I think the scale of it and training it really efficiently was also part of that, yeah. But the, the intuition is the same. And that's why I kind of still love it when, when you think of these birds and all this, at the core, these dimensions are probably uh, the equivalent of a PCA basis vector that was really useful for uh, uh, clustering uh, uh, the space. And each vector is kind of a representation of how often that word co-occur with that cluster. That, that, that at least for me is a good intuition of what these different dimensions are, yeah. Oh yeah, yeah, there's, a, there's been a lot of interesting work um, uh, of people trying to bring uh, kind of human knowledge in those embeddings. Um, 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 I, 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 I will have to look back at, at the paper. This is about 2013, we're about around that time. Um, I don't see this. Yeah, so, but there was an interesting thing because um, one thing that found is like, it worked really well, but also for cold and hot, it didn't work so well. And so people were spend uh, probably the next three or four years until uh, Elmo came out um, and then Bert, um, like it, 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 the goal was to, what, can I bring that extra knowledge? Now, what will happen eventually historically is that we try to add that extra knowledge. And finally, what we finally accepted is that let's not try to encode words, let's try to encode sentences. And once we started encoding sentences, a lot of that subtlety just got um, uh, learned into the sentence embedding. And then at that point, we didn't need that extra. But for about four years, we did a lot of these uh, extensions, which I thought were really interesting. But now these days, we're, we're just data-driven, and we do sentence level, yeah.
Okay, great. Um, so yeah, so um, it, if you get a word and then the similarity, like it's, it's uh, at the at that level doesn't mean as much, but if you transform it in that representation of 300, then it, 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 it learned that subspace and that subspace really is more meaningful. And so two words can really mean something uh, when you look at a uh, similarity between them. Um, uh, and then they did some cool things, uh, uh, like uh, so. Um, they they took the vector of the word king, um, and then the vector of the word man, the vector of the word woman, and then they did arithmetic. So king minus man plus woman, and then they get, and then they they sample closest words from that, and the closest word was queen or one of the closest one. And then they did a few other things like um, look at the general direction. Like if you plot, um, I don't know, some PCA uh, or TSNE of it and like start plotting all of the countries and all of their, uh, all of their uh, 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 capitals, there was just a general trend that they're in the same direction as well. So. So, so the bipole, the, these are trained statically, one data set, and that there's been work uh, usually often like related to Twitter uh, because they, it has its own uh, or Reddit now these days where where people start using expression and they reuse them. And um, in fact, in fact, yeah, a lot of times a new word gets started to be used, but to really understand the meaning of that word, like a little bit like Bardewick. I mean, I, I, I don't follow Twitter, TikTok, and all this, but sometimes words comes out, I'm like, what does it mean? But then you see it used in a few sentences, and you're like, oh, that's probably what they mean with that word. It's the same as that old word that also existed. So uh, it, um, so that, that basic concept, that the, the context of a word, seems to still generalize, but there's been work on, like, domain adaptation or domain time shift adaptation um, to, to adapt these over time, doing it in an efficient way so don't, you don't have to retrain the whole model over time. There's been some of these work, um, especially um, in this area of like social network as for example, yeah. But the by default is usually one corpus you train from that, yeah. Okay, uh, so some of the old one, uh, fast text was a kind of an interesting one because it was a character base. It was a uh, character by character. So it was handling like uh, new country words or new made up words a little bit better. And um, this is Elmo, by the way, it's certainly, I should share that uh, Elmo uh, came out. We'll share a little bit in a second, the details of that. Um, but it was a very short lived one. It won the best paper award at NACL, but by the time it got the paper, it was already history at that point, I think. And Bert had come out and just blown away everyone. So um, I think, but, but it's funny because I was at that NACL and they, they did get the best paper award. It was a great achievement, but by that time already uh, Bert. Um, but now Bert uh, and Transformers are still state of the arts, so oh, at least up close to it. So, um, so um, I just want to share, uh, because we, we do a lot about like uh, these uh, words to make and bird, but for your research, think uh, maybe to use lexicons as well, because if you want interpretability, these vector 300, although I kind of gave you an intuition that each dimension is related to a cluster of word and how often that word you're interested in co-occur with that cluster, but um, lexicon allows you, so it's human built. One of the most popular is LIWC, um, is, is like 800, uh, 800, 85 different dimensions. So it, it will take a sentence and, and count. In fact, LIWC word count, that's WC, <laughs> word count. It, it, it really is just gonna count. Uh, there's a big dictionary. Uh, and so for each concept, it has a dictionary and will come, but it, it's a nice characterization of a sentence. Is it a positive sentence? Is it a sentence about the past? Is it a sentence where the verbs are about thinking, uh, about uh, friendship, different kind of interesting. So from an interpretation perspective, that's a better characterization because that 85 dimensions 
each dimension means something. And there's a lot of interesting extension to uh, related work uh, on these lexicon kind of uh, representation. So just think of it as another representation that you could use in your research that may bring more interpretability. But uh, recently, all of the representation are really sentence-based, sentence-based representation. Um, so if you have a sentence like the ideal uh, for anyone with an interest in disguise, um, and let's say that I have a right now a sequence prediction task. What does a sequence prediction task would be? For every word, I'm trying to predict a label, let's say. Uh, maybe it's part of speech tag, like is it a noun, a verb, or some, or maybe it's a, how the positive, negative each word is. So if I want, I can take word to vec, take the word, word to vec embedding, and just learn a neural network to predict that. So that would be, but it doesn't take into consideration the uh, sentence, the fact that words have a sequence to it. So um, I'm not going to spend so much time on it, but there's the idea of recurrent neural network. They, they, they lost a lot of uh, steam in the recent years, but I just want to bring it as a... Um, so a recurrent neural network, in this case, the prediction of, a, of how positive or not the word is will not just be dependent on your embedding of that word, but will also be uh, dependent on the previous words. Um, so to do that efficiently, um, I will show it in a second, but how is the loss function in this case? What is the loss? The loss will be how well you predict each word in itself. So it will just be a summation of how well you predict each word. Uh, I'm saying that because if you train something, you have always to think, where is my loss and how is my gradient gonna go and, and propagate into this? Um, so in this case, for a recurrent neural network to, this is a normal feed forward neural network. I have my input, hidden layer, I have my output scores, and then from the scores, I compare with the uh, real label and I get a loss. Um, and, and I explicitly put here the way, the parameters for each of the layers. Um, so each layers will have its own weight uh, associated with it. Now, this is feed forward neural network. For recurrent neural network, the idea is my prediction at this hidden state will not be dependent just on my current observation, but it will also be dependent on my previous uh, prediction. So let me unroll this. What it means is that prediction at time two will be based on my observation at time two, but also based on that previous hidden state. Similarly, at time three, it is predicted uh, my observation at time three, but also my previous one and go on and go on like this. The, the key aspect here is I want to learn that recurrence without increasing the number of parameters. I don't want to have too many parameters in this. So I will do the concept of tying the weights. I'm going to tie the weights. What it means is the way these are encoded, the way, oh, 11, 10. The way I'm encoding information, the way I'm encoding information, the U matrix here is going to be the exact same U matrix here, the exact same U matrix here, and the exact same U matrix here. What it means is in this case, the how is the gradient going here, the back propagation? So I go and I found how well I managed to predict. And I looked how well and I succeeded. And then I back propagate and I fix here the V. So this matrix V, how often, if it's a sequence of five, how often that matrix V will be updated in one pass of back propagation? How often that V matrix will be 
uh, great, uh, if the sentence it has five words, five times, five times the V will be updated. So for this, I will update it the V and, and, and the gradient, the error that was here will be added to this. There, the V, the error that was it will be also be added to the same V, the error, and I have five words. So the same matrix, the, the same uh, weights or parameters get uh, updated. So, so the error on that word will have an impact on the same. That's what tying the weights mean. I have only one set of parameters, uh, but they all get uh, updated by each of those. Uh, um, so that's when, when you say a model has tied weights, it means that the parameters, uh, if, if the back propagation goes in for many different paths, they all gonna update the same matrix. But yeah, uh, and, and it doesn't matter in a sense the order, because what I will do is I will do a first time feed forward as with all my VU, you do it completely for everything. And then, and then, uh, and then after that, when I start doing the back propagation everywhere, I keep updating V and U, but it doesn't have a direct impact anyway. So the ordering, uh, I mean, it has some, I mean, there's, there's a, a flow of things that will go, but uh, the, the fact that I will put the gradient from this into V and then this into V, whichever order doesn't really matter as long as it goes there and get accumulated. So this is recurrent neural network. Um, and so the same model parameter for all parts. And so how, I, how can I, with the recurrent neural network, encode one label for the whole sentence? So I, I showed you a recurrent neural network, but if I have only one label, how do I work? So I, I, I drop all of this, and now the gradient is only going to come from the, this part, and then it's going to be propagated in the rest of it. But the gradient will come only from the end. Now, as you can see, it's only from the left. So there was extension. Oh, so the loss in this case is only from that uh, last part. And uh, oh, I, I, that's true. Right. So one thing is, uh, how do you do it both ways? I'm about to show it, but I want to explain for people who are not in NLP, the term language model, because it's a very confusing term. Language model seems like a generic term. It's a model of language, like, like any kind of model that has language as input should be called a language model. But no, language model in NLP means a specific thing. Language model is, comes from speech recognition, specifically from the field of speech recognition. It, it, it is about how can I predict the next word? I want a model that given a, a beginning of a sentence, I can predict the next word, okay? And the earlier version of it were those models were uh, uh, either it's called unigram, bigram, or trigram. It was like uh, use one word, or let's say this is a trigram model. So use three words and predict the next one. And then shift, use those three words and predict the next one. And then take those three words, predict the next. That was what's called a trigram language model. Now, these days, we're going to accumulate. So as you go along, you're like ideal and you're gonna predict the next word and then you're gonna do it in a recursive manner. So you will say, okay, now that I have those two words, let me predict the third word. Now that I have those three words, let me predict the fourth word. This is a more of a recursive, uh, not recursive, um, uh, uh, but in a repetitive way. Uh, I'm blanking on the words today, um, but yeah, so how, how do you do this? Why do you do this? How did, was, why was it invented? It was, I, I'm not, I have to double check my history, but I'm like 90% certain it was as part of speech recognition. One of the reason is that if you are decoding what has been said and you're trying to understand from what has been said, what is the sequence of words that has been said, 
Uh, if you look at this mathematically um, and just to base rule, what you will get the, the core part of it is, 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 is repeated here is you get what's the acoustic model. Um, so the acoustic model, which is like, hey, uh, given some words, like, uh, is, is it likely that I will see this acoustic? But the language model will be like, hey, is this series of words something I can really trust? Or is it something that's likely to see in the English vocabulary? And I, I didn't put the equation for it. I, I just realized that. Huh? I didn't put the equation for it, but P of words uh, of this is like, is like P of W1, W2, let's say, okay, uh, uh, let's go just like, so this is the probability of seeing these four words in a sequence in that order. And so I can, I can use, and decouple this is like, what is the probability that I, I, I see um, W2 given that I saw W1? What is the probability that I see W3 given that I see W1, uh, W2 before it? And so you can, you can um, chain it this way. So at the, to know if that sentence is likely to be answered or to be in the English, uh, normal language, I can go and start looking locally how likely it is to see those pair of words after one after another. So the language model, that, that's, that's the core of the language model. Like given that I've seen those words, how likely that I will see the next word to be. Uh, so there's a lot of interest at that point. This is probably in the 90s, 80s about language model. They were helping speech recognition quite well. Now, these days, we use language model for self-supervised learning as a way to learn and train lang uh, uh, re representation for language. But originally, these were for speech recognition. So language models are these models where I take as input, this is a unigram language model. Or where like, so usually, there's always a start token. Okay, so English dictionary, one hot encoding, let's say 300,000. No, it's 3,000, 300,000 and one. Okay, in fact, it's and two because there's a start and an end uh, token uh, as well. And so, and then from there, you're going to predict the next word. And, and you, in an auto regressive, that's the term I was searching, um, way you will uh, take whatever word was predicted here, copy it here in a one hot encoding, and now go ahead and predict the next word, and then go ahead and predict the next word. So this, in fact, can work two different ways. One is um, where you are giving it a start, or you could give it a few words as input, encode those words as input. I will show you in a second how to do this. But yeah, if you start, so this is a language model. So how do you uh, train this? How is the loss? So it's the same loss as earlier. Like, so how well you predicted each of the words in an autoregressive way, that's how you train. So now it's nice, just give me any corpus in English. And I can train this model. Um, and so, and then what happened is that you can, after you train it, and once it's trained, then I can take any sentence and take that last embedding, and that becomes a sequence embedding. So that's a sentence embedding. That's, that encodes my whole sentence. Okay. And but it encodes my sentence only from left to right. And that's what I was telling you earlier. But sometimes you also want to look at the meaning both ways. So there is the bidirectional uh, RNN, recurrent neural network. So really what it is, is just two recurrent network, completely almost independent, like two recurrent neural network, one going from left to right. And uh, so, so what, what, how were they trained? 
So I didn't show it here, but they, they, each of them are trained the, the same autoregressive way. Like, so, so this, you see it for the left, imagine the same for the right. So this is a train for the left and the same for the right. But if once I train it, I can use it to encode. And then how do I represent a sentence? I can just concatenate. So 300 for the left, 300 for the right. And I can just concatenate. And I said, um, um, yeah, so the Elmo, that was the short lived one, was a bi directional um, uh, RNN. Uh, I'm not on purpose, I, I didn't um, discuss, but there, there's uh, families of recurrent neural networks. The most popular at that time was LSTM, long short term memory. Um, I have many slides about it, but I, I've, I've thrown away all of them because it was not needed anymore for, for this uh, new edition of the class. Um, but if you want or have questions about it, happy to discuss. There's uh, a few uh, other ones uh, that were uh, other type of recurrent neural networks. So, so if you see LSTM, it's just a type of recurrent neural network into this. Um, so yeah, the ELMO was a bidirectional LSTM that just used both sides to encode. Um, there was at the same time, this concept of masking. And, and now these days you keep hearing like masking as a really cool thing, like in computer vision, like everybody, oh my gosh, there's this, uh, uh, what was the name? Uh, one of the vision, transformer that did 70% of masking. And because of that, it did amazing performance. Um, Emmy. Emmy, yeah, Emmy, yes. Um, so, so, and it's really cool, but what, okay, maybe not exactly for images, but for language, what does masking is at the end of the day that we just learned today? It's this distributional hypothesis. It, 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 it's exactly, yeah, predicting a word from its context. That, that's what masking is doing for language. Now, does it, 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 now are we using it in computer vision and even in speech we see it? So now, but the basic concept of masking come from NLP. And so the idea here is, 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 is slightly done differently. Masking is done differently than word to vec. Word to vec was, I give me a word and I'm gonna predict its context. That is, it's almost done the opposite way. The masking usually at least is done sometimes. The, it's kind of doing the other way of word to vec. It's saying, hey, let, let me give you the context and find the words. You're, you're going the other way around as word to vec. So I mask it and what, what is gonna be my loss? My loss is just gonna be over all, any word that was masked. Uh, so here I have only one of them, and, and, and that's the, the short-lived Elmo uh, that uh, that we talk uh, nicely. And that, uh, as you probably see, the Street Elmo Bird. That, that's how they all came from. So, um, so uh, machine translation was, um, and it's really funny because I, I was talking um, uh, with a friend who was teaching machine translation, and uh, at that time, uh, up to like 2017. Everything like there was a big change in machine translation. Uh, I don't know, early 2010 or 2014 about um, uh, sequence to sequence uh, transform. Right? So machine translation for a while was all recurrent neural network in a sequence to sequence because what they will do is they will say, "Hey, let me encode with a recurrent neural network one language, and I get this embedding of that uh, in that language." and use that as the seed to generate in the other language. So le chien sur la plage, the dog on the beach. And so, and, and so then you, you get this, con this concept of encoder, decoder, or sequence to sequence. It's, it was also called sequence to sequence or encoder decoder architecture. And that got really popular also in computer and multimodal. So people will do encode an image and decode in text or encode a text and decode an image. That was a little bit less often. Often it was encode image, decode text. Um, so this is a, a nice LSTM or a recurrent neural network that take, what, what would be this token here? 
Is there one hot encoding? Huh? Start, yeah, start, yeah. So this would be start, and then it will be D, uh, and then do, D will be copied here, dog, and will be copied here on. So, uh, so the loss, where's the loss here? It's just in the decoder. Um, so then you have two choices. Now these days, you would probably pre-train this in your language first so that you have, because you have to think that my gradient, if I make an error, it, it has to go and propagate all the way here. Like it's, it's, it, 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 it's a little bit, takes time. Um, uh, take, takes, you could vanish. Now, what's, what's the advantage? Uh, wh why is it less of an issue? The gradient, let's say it, it fails here, the loss is high, uh, and, and then the gradient propagate, it propagates here, but it will take a long time to propagate here. But the good news is any mistake here has an impact on the exact same weight as here because it's a recurrent neural network. So any error here or here, they all, uh, this will be a set of parameters but the weights will be tied together. And these will be a set of parameters. These will be tied together, but they will be different between the encoder and decoder. So you will have a set of weights here. So the gradients and, and yes, it's gonna take a little bit to get here, but nicely these words, it takes even longer to get here, but any impact on the gradient here, will it be on the same set of parameters as if it happened here? So that's why it was not so bad of a thing for the sequence to sequence, but there's two set of parameters. Um, coming uh, soon, uh, transformers, we'll talk about it in about uh, a week or two, uh, which are um, uh, building from the idea of attention. Um, and so now these days, uh, a lot of representation sentences are not recurrent based. And that's why I didn't go into the details of like GRU and LSTM and all this, but I wanted to at least get you the historical part of recurrent neural network because you still see them sometime in papers uh, as well. Um, the last part I want to do today is uh, about syntax uh, and language structure. That's the last part for today. And, and, uh, and the main two things, there's two main things. I mean, I would like to give you a full course on NLP and I invite you There's some great course uh, in LPI on this, but I would like, if there's two things I would like to you to understand for language is one is uh, uh, like, if you look at this sentence, you can start and look at like for each word, identify if it's a noun, verb, uh, adjective, that's what we'll often refer a part of speech tag, okay? But, um, there's another term, there's a few terms I want you to at least get. Non phrase, a non phrase. So, a non phrase is a bringing together the non and its adjective. Uh, and, and also, if it was the yellow squash, this would be a non phrase. Okay. And this is a really useful unit of analysis if you think about it, because often yellow squash visually will be an object. Like it's not just the squash, but the adjective. So noun phrases are really useful. Verb phrases brings the verb and uh, the noun phrase together. And then you have the sentence. So what is the, so there's three things I want to share. Part of speech tag, syntactic parse tree takes this information and put it in a tree. So you have all of your noun phrases nicely identified. So if you ask me language, what is a good uh, unit of analysis in a sentence? Noun phrases are a really good piece of information to get. And there's nice parsers that exist that take a sentence and go. There is the third thing that I want to uh, share with you, which is words and noun and verb also have function or dependencies between them. So a verb and the subject of the verb or the object of the verb or even the attribute of a noun, this is called dependency grammar. This is a different way of parsing sentences than uh, a phrase structure grammar. So sometimes you think of grammar as just one thing. The grammar can be observed from different facets. I'm giving you at least two of them. 
The one is phrase structure grammar, and that gives you a nice way to take a sentence. And we talk about structure of a sentence. The visual observed uh, structure is a sequence, but there's also this hidden structure, which is more of a, 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 a tree base in this case. And so the last thing that I will say is, oh, they just decided that it was over, uh, is that there's a lot of ambiguity in this kind of uh, parsing. Uh, words will be often, and I will just show this nice little cute one. So Selman sold the dog biscuit. There's ambiguity in that. Um, you could sell, so the Selman sold dog biscuit, or that doesn't happen as often. Selman sold the dog biscuit, okay? But you can see that that thing alone doesn't happen. And so a lot of the work has been done on like handling those ambiguity as well. So when you think about uh, using language, think about that structure that you could take advantage of and how you will integrate it in your uh, multimodal uh, data. So, okay, thank you very much.